Thank you. <laughs> From the first day I was born, you've had your rise. Set on me, keeping me safe in your love. All of my days I will sing joyfully. Lord, you are good to me, always oh, so good to me. Lord, you are good to me. Oh, we're so good to me. You all of my joy and my fears. Though I was alone, you were near. Guiding me through darkest night and removing the doubt and the fear Lord you are good to me always oh, so good to me Lord you are good to me always oh, so good to me I'm yours, you are mine, you gave me a purpose I could not find out of the darkness into the light leading me on and gave Oh Lord, you are good to me. Oh, we're so good to me. Lord, you are good to me. Oh, we're so good to me. You loved me before I loved you. You let me know. By dying for me That I was well worth The price That you paid for me At Calvary Lord, you are good to me Always so good to me to me oh we so good to me Lord you are good to me oh we so good to me never step on the cord when you're trying to thrill it When I bend down like that and try to pick it up, it's not like I'm, I can't do it. It's just I'm trying not to pop this thing out. So just in case somebody might be looking at me and going, hey, he has a hard time going. No, I'm trying to not throw this thing out here. Gosh. Got to make sure. All right. Uh, good evening. Turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 4. Uh, look at verse 1. Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. And we're going to uh, note verse 33. We're almost near the uh, We're at the end of the chapter. Chapter 4, we're almost done with it, and, uh, and then we'll be done with the story of Nebuchadnezzar. He, he concern, he, he's the uh, topic of study quite a bit in the first four chapters, of course, and then we go into 
uh, Belshazzar much later on, well after Nebuchadnezzar has died, uh, when we get to chapter 5. Now, uh, you should be at Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to note verse 33 this evening. And this verse, we're going to have Nebuchadnezzar suffering from bo- boanthropy the very moment the voice from heaven told the king that the sentence against him was executed. So that'll be our subject here uh, this evening. And um, let's take a moment of silent prayer to prepare ourselves to hear the teaching of the word of God, uh, confessing our sins if necessary. That restores us to fellowship, and we maintain the fellowship by obeying the Spirit who speaks to us through the teaching of the Word of God. Remember, that's being filled with the Spirit when we're obeying the Spirit as He teaches us through the Word of God. And then uh, we, uh, if we have anything that's bothering us, disturbing and distracting to us, we can apply uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, or we could do 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So uh, with that said, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for another day to study your word. We thank you for another day to enjoy and experience fellowship with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, and with other believers who are in fellowship with you. We thank you, Father, for uh, the rain that you provided for us in the last week or so. We thank you for this much-needed rain. We thank you for providing for us logistically everything that we need to sustain our bodies, to sustain human life here on this earth. And we thank you for all the blessings that we have because of our union and identification with your Son, Jesus Christ. It is awesome, Father, that we, and we thank you and praise you for the fact that we're going to live with you for all of eternity, and uh, we just thank you for that, and delivering us from eternal condemnation, giving us the forgiveness of our sins, treating us in grace and in love. We just thank you so much, Father, uh, for that, and help us to always look back at the cross and also what the Spirit has done for us and is doing for us and will do for us in the future, so that we might experience and or attain spiritual self-esteem. Help us to look at our meaning and get, derive our meaning and significance and purpose in life from our relationship with you and not from circumstances and people, how much money we have, the homes we live in, <clears throat> the cars we drive, the, the salary we have. Help us to understand and convict us that uh, it's more important than our, our relationship with you. That is the most important thing in life. So help us to uh, uh, make decisions in life that are according to your word. Give us discernment. Help us to understand and be aware that the devil and, and our sin nature seek to deceive us and to going against your will. So help us to uh, maintain our priorities. Help us to uh, focus upon what your word says and walk by faith and not by sight. We thank you, Father, for those who are uh, listening in this evening on Pal Talk. We thank you for them and those who might be uh, listening in or viewing this class through the website. And also we thank you for those here in the Thompson household. We thank you so much for Titus and Jody raising them up and uh, allowing us to uh, teach in their home on a, on a daily basis, four times a week. We thank you, Father, for their sacrifice and, and that what they've done for, the, uh, for you and the cause of the gospel. And we pray that you would, I know you will remember them and reward them greatly for that. We thank you for all the others in this ministry that have been supporting this ministry, not only giving of their, their time, talent, and treasure, and, uh, but also... Um, per, being part of this ministry, attending Bible class. We thank you for the Fletches and George and Alice and Pixie, and uh, we just thank you for them that are on Pal Talk all the time. We thank you for Vaughn and Debbie and, and others, in, and Susie and down in Alabama. We thank you for all of them that are following us through the website and others that we don't know about. And Father, this evening we pray that the Holy Spirit would do a mighty work through all of us. We pray that he would give grace to myself, the communicator, so that I could uh, teach your people with accuracy and clarity, reverence and respect and power, help them to learn through the power of the Spirit, help them to concentrate. We pray that no one would do anything that's disturbing and distracting to those who are serious students of the Word of God. We pray that you would help Titus and Tyler uh, do the word, uh, the sound and the recordings. We just pray that we thank you for their service, and we pray that we wouldn't have any problems with Pal Talk. We thank you for the technology that you've given us 
so that we could fellowship with others around the world, not just in this state or in this country. So, Father, we thank you for these things. We pray that we'd have a great time fellowshipping in you. We're continuing to grow in the grace and knowledge of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it is in his name we pray. Amen. Daniel chapter 4, verse 1 is where you should be. I'm going to read off my translation. You should have my translation of Daniel chapter 4, which reflects uh, my interpretation. And, of course, we've covered the first uh, 32 verses of the chapter. As I noted before, the opening prayer, we're going to do uh, verse 33 this evening. So I'll read all the way through up to verse 33. And then what I'll do is, as my custom, we'll go to the New American Standard, look at the text there. Uh, and uh, in Daniel 4.33, and then make some changes to the translation, and then, uh, and then have our own translation. Uh, a lot of times I won't touch the, the passage because it doesn't need to be touched. It, it's, it's a good tran- I feel it's good translation. So when I don't uh, look at the original language of certain parts of, of the passage, it's only because I find it is to be uh, a, a good translation. So uh, look at verse, 30, uh, verse 1, please. Daniel chapter 4, verse 1 in my translation. The first three verses, of course, have the introduction to the proclamation. King Nebuchadnezzar, to each and every person belonging to the nations, ethnicities, and language groups who are living throughout the entire earth, may your prosperity increase. It is pleasing to me to make known the miraculous signs, yes, and wondrous signs at that, which the Most High God performed on my behalf. How great are his, his miraculous signs. Indeed, how great are his wondrous signs. His kingdom is eternal. In other words, his governmental dominion is from generation to generation. Remember, he's writing retrospectively. It's retrospective exposition. He's looking back uh, at the discipline. Remember, he's a believer. He was a believer before the discipline, being deposed from power for seven years, and he, of course, is one after it. The difference between him before being deposed and after being deposed as he's now humble after being deposed. And now he's growing in his relationship with the Lord. Now look at verse 4. I myself, Nebuchadnezzar, was content in my house, specifically prosperous in my palace. I saw a dream which caused me to be frightened, specifically revelations on my bed. Indeed, visions in my mind caused me to be terrified. Therefore, from me, a command was issued for the purpose of causing each and every one of the city of Babylon's wise men to be brought into my presence in order that they could make known to me the dream's interpretation. So when the occult priests, necromancers, necromancers, astrologers, as well as diviners entered, I communicated the content of the dream before them, but they could not make its interpretation known to me. Then Daniel entered my presence, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to my God's name, prior to his conversion. And in addition, one who possesses God's Holy Spirit in him. Next, I communicated the content of the dream before him. O Belteshazzar, this is what he said to Daniel. O Belteshazzar, chief over the wise men. He addresses Daniel according to his Babylonian name because he's speaking before the Babylonian court and everybody there, the wise men, would all know Daniel by his Babylonian name. O Belteshazzar, chief over the wise men because I myself know personally that God's Holy Spirit is in you he knew personally because of what we saw in chapter 2 and in, remember Daniel 2.47 the king attributed Daniel's ability to, uh, to interpret dreams from his God that's why we, if, if you look at my translation he says in verse 9, O Belteshazzar, chief over the wise men, because I myself know personally that God's Holy Spirit is in you, not a spirit of the holy gods. That would be Nebuchadnezzar attributing uh, Daniel's ability to interpret dreams to the pagan gods. So, uh, and that would conflict with what he said in Daniel 2.47. So verse 9, O Belteshazzar, chief over the wise men, because I know myself know personally that God's Holy Spirit is in you, so that any mystery is by no means too difficult for you, Please consider the content of my dream, which I saw also. Please communicate its interpretation. Now we have in verses 10 through 17 the content of the dream. Now concerning the visions in my mind on my bed, I was in a trance-like state staring as behold, a tree was in the midst of the earth. In fact, its height was enormous. The tree became enormous so that it was strong. Indeed, its height reached to the heavens so that it was visible as far as the extremity of the, end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful. Also, its fruit was abundant so that food was in it for the benefit of all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. Also, the birds of the sky lived in its branches. Indeed, each and every living creature 
was fed from it. Remember, God's appealing to his frame of reference. And Babylonian inscriptions have Nebuchadnezzar uh, 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 describing himself as a great spreading cedar tree. This, was, uh, this is found in Ezekiel 31 with the king of Assyria. God describes him as a great tree. So is Nebuchadnezzar here. Uh, uh, God's appealing to his frame of reference. Nebuchadnezzar described himself as a great tree. And the reason why he was terrified is that he knows the tree is a human being because of verse 16. But he also knows that he considers himself a great tree. And for the tree to get cut down scared him. That's why he got terrified. He, he, had a, he sensed that it was about him. Now look at verse 13. Because verses 10 through 12 just give, this, give us the circumstances at the time Nebuchadnezzar received this revelation from God. Now we have what's going to happen to the king in, in symbolic terms in verses 13 through 17. I was in a trance-like state staring because of the visions in my mind on my bed as behold, a watchman, yes, a holy one, descended out from the heavens. He publicly proclaimed with authority and said, cut down the tree. Also lop off its branches, strip off its foliage, furthermore scatter its fruit. Let the beast flee out from under it as well as the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave intact in the ground the taproot which produces its roots, but with a band composed of iron as well as bronze in the midst of the wild grass produced by the open field. Also, let it be drenched with the dew from heaven as well as its dwelling place among the beasts and the grass produced by the field." Let his mind be transformed from, from a human being. Instead, let a beast's mind be given to him. Then let seven years pass by for him. This sentence is by the watchman's decree, the Trinity. Yes, this decision is a command from the holy ones in order that the human race would admit that the Most High is the sovereign authority over mankind's realm. Therefore, he can give it to whomever he desires. He can even establish ordinary men over it. Now, verse 18. This is the dream I myself, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw. Now as for you, O Belteshazzar, please communicate the interpretation because each and every one of the wise men belonging to my kingdom is absolutely unable to make known to me the interpretation. However, in contrast to them, you are able because God's Holy Spirit is in you. Now notice that the content of the dream is bracketed by Nebuchadnezzar's uh, admission that his wise men can't interpret the dream they're impotent to, whereas Daniel has the ability to do this. So the content of the dream itself is bracketed. On either side of it is our statements from Nebuchadnezzar saying that his wise men can't do it, can't interpret the dream, but Daniel can. Now look at verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was shocked for a brief period of time so that his thoughts caused him to be terrified. And the king responded and said, Belteshazzar, don't let the content of the dream as well as the interpretation cause you to be terrified. And Belteshazzar replied and said, May the content of the dream be against those who hate you. Indeed, it's interpretation against your enemies. Now, verses 20 through 26, we have the interpretation. Verse 20, the tree that you saw, which became enormous, so that it was strong, indeed whose height reached to the heavens, so that it was visible throughout the entire earth, and in addition, whose foliage was beautiful, as well as its fruit was abundant, so that food was in it for the benefit of all. Under it the beasts of the field lived, as well as in its branches the birds of the sky nested. It is you, O king. And now he gives his reasons. For you become enormous so that you are strong. Indeed, your greatness has become enormous so that it has reached to the heavens in the sense that your governmental authority extends to the extremity of the earth. Moreover, in view of the fact that the king, here's the second reason, in view of the fact that the king saw a watchman, yes, a holy one, descending out from the heavens, the pre-incarnate Christ, cut down the saying, cut down the tree, in other words, destroy it, however, leave intact in the ground the taproot, which produces its roots, but with a band composed of iron as well as bronze in the midst of the wild grass produced by the open field. Let also, let it be drenched with the dew from heaven as well as its dwelling place among the beasts and the grass produced by the field until seven years pass by for him. Note the repetition. It's, it's for rhetorical effect. It's also Daniel's re repeating the dream back to Nebuchadnezzar so the king knows that he's got it straight and therefore he can count on his interpretation to be accurate. Now look at verse 24. This is the interpretation to follow, O king. Specifically, the decree is from the most high which has been issued against my lord the king. Namely, that you'll be driven away from mankind so that your dwelling place will be among the beasts of the field. You'll even be fed grass like cattle. That's, this is us, we say, he's going to suffer from boanthropy, which is 
acting in, uh, like, a ca- uh, like a cow or a bull. Then he says, furthermore, you'll be drenched with the dew from heaven, exposed to the elements, because he's out there with the cattle. Indeed, for your benefit, seven years will pass by until you acknowledge that the Most High is the sovereign authority over the realm of mankind so that he can give it to whomever he desires. This is the whole point of him being deposed, so that he would admit that God's sovereign over him. Verse 26, however... In view of the fact that they decreed, the Trinity, to leave intact the tree's taproot, which produces its roots, your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge the heaven's rule. Therefore, O king, based upon my interpretation, here's my advice to you. And his advice reveals that Nebuchadnezzar is a believer. O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Please substitute your sins with righteousness, specifically your iniquities, by demonstrating mercy to the poor. Then your prosperity will be prolonged. Each and every detail took place for the benefit of Nebuchadnezzar the king. At the end of 12 months, one year, he was walking about on the roof of the city of Babylon's royal palace and the king posed a rhetorical question to himself, which from his perspective demanded an emphatic affirmation. Is, and I won't do the voice I like to do, my, my, my Shakespearean actor, is this not, I'm tempted to, is this not the great Babylon which I myself have built her for a royal residence by means of my mighty military power as well as for the praise of my greatness? And from his perspective again, yes, it's me. While while this statement was in the king's mouth, a voice came down from the heavens, undoubtedly the, the, the watchman, the holy watchman of verses 13 through 17. We declare to you, notice we, the trinity, Declare this isn't this the remember the masculine plural form of this verb here translated we declare is another indication that the holy watchmen and verse 17 is a reference to the Trinity. We declare to you, not we announce to you, we declare to you. We declare to you, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty has been taken away from you. You're going to be deposed. Specifically, you'll be driven away from mankind so that your dwelling place will be among the beasts of the field. You'll be fed grass like cattle, indeed for your benefit. Seven years will pass by until you acknowledge that the Most High is the sovereign authority over mankind's realm so that he can give it to whomever he desires. Then our verse for the evening. At that very moment, the command was executed for the benefit of Nebuchadnezzar. Consequently, he was driven away from mankind. He even habitually ate grass like cattle. Furthermore, He was continually drenched with the dew from heaven until his hair became extremely long like eagle's feathers, likewise his nails like a bird's claws. Now, if you look at verse 33 in the New American Standard, it says immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. The word immediately, it's it's actually a prepositional phrase. And uh, it's not a bad translation. It's composed of the preposition baith. Its object is is the third person feminine singular pronominal suffix he, which is also followed by the the noun sha'ah. Now, this preposition is what we call a temporal marker, meaning at, referring to the hour in which the sentence against Nebuchadnezzar was executed. Now, the word, uh, the third person feminine singular pronominal suffix he, it means that because it's functioning like a demonstrative pronoun. And it's pointing out the noun sha'ah, which means the same moment. The, and that refers to a point. Uh, that word sha'a refers to a point of time simultaneously with another point of time. So what I'm telling you is that these three words form an expression which literally means at that very moment or at that same moment, and it, because they speak of a specific period of time or point of time, simultaneous, uh, simultaneous with another point of time. So the two points of time. What are we talking about with the two points of time? The two points of time which this prepositional phrase is referring is, is, is speaking of are, that are simultaneous with each other are presented to the reader in verses 31 through 33, which we read. The point of time simultaneous with the actions recorded in verses 31 and 32 is recorded here in verse 33, which records that the sentence against Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. So what I'm telling you is this, therefore, this expression indicates immediately or at that very moment, the sentence against the king was executed. So this prepositional phrase, which introduces verse 33, is emphasizing the swiftness of the execution of the sentence against Nebuchadnezzar. It's trying to convey the idea that God didn't waste any time. As soon as it was time, boom, he did it.
No delay. It was executed. He gave the king plenty of time to repent, but when that didn't happen, God immediately executed the sentence against them. So it talks about the swiftness in which God moves. You, many times we often wonder, uh, why doesn't uh, God... Why doesn't God... <laughs> Her eyes go like this. It was like uh, Mo over there. And uh, it was so funny. It was cute. I like it. So anyways, we see that the, God swifted his execution of the sentence. Now, this tells you, we often wonder, oh, uh, is God, uh, you know, like we take the case with Adolf Hitler. Oh, why did God wait so long? Well, no, the, God, when, when Hitler had his time and it was time for him to die, that was over. His life was ended. Same with Stalin or anybody else. Boom, it's, it's done. He executes the sentence. Nebuchadnezzar, it, it, this, this phrase uh, that's translated immediately, this prepositional phrase, it's talking about the swiftness in which God moved to, to, uh, to uh, depose Nebuchadnezzar from power. Now, the word, when it says the word, if you look at verse 33 in the New American Standard, immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. The word, uh, the word is the word milah, which means the command, actually. I don't like the translation the word, um, the uh, Net Bible translates it pronouncement. Uh, the ESV says the word as well. But I like uh, the reason why I like command better is because that's what it's it's referring to uh, the commands uh, that are found in verses fourteen through sixteen. It is used in a collective sense. This word for the eight commands issued by the holy watchmen in verses 14 through 16, which according to Daniel's interpretation in verses 20 through 26, which we read, symbolized Nebuchadnezzar being deposed from power for seven years while suffering boanthropy. So what I'm telling you is that this word milah, translated the word, I like command better because it's speaking with reference to those eight commands that are found in verses 14 through 16, which collectively means that Nebuchadnezzar is going to be deposed from power. That's exact. That's why we read those things tonight. It's collectively. You look at all those eight commands in verses fourteen through sixteen. They they uh, they're, they constitute Nebuchadnezzar being deposed from power. The eight commands are uh, 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 are being referenced here with this one word milah. Now it says uh, they were fulfilled. Uh, this command was fulfilled. The word uh, was fulfilled is the Hebrew word or the Aramaic word. Excuse me. It's the pe'al, perfect form of the word suf, is the way it's pronounced. It means to execute. What's fulfilled is not bad. I like execute because the word subject is melah, which I have told you means the command. And therefore, this verb, suf, it means that this command to depose Nebuchadnezzar from power by giving him the mental disorder of boanthropy was executed immediately. Now, when it says concerning Nebuchadnezzar, that's a prepositional phrase. Uh, the word that's uh, translated concerning, it's the preposition al, and this is what we call a marker of advantage. We've, we've referenced this before in the chapter. Uh, it could have, you could translate it two different ways. You could translate it for the benefit of Nebuchadnezzar, meaning this, this sentence against him to be deposed from power was for his benefit to humble him. And you could also translate it as a marker of, di this preposition as a marker of disadvantage or opposition, meaning against and where if it was a marker of advantage, that means for the benefit of. Both work, because both, if you look at it from the holiness of God, it's a marker of opposition, a marker of disadvantage. It's against, this, this command is, that was executed was against Nebuchadnezzar. But then it was also, from, if you look at it from God's attribute of love, and which, which flow from his attribute of love is his grace policy toward Nebuchadnezzar, is that it was for his benefit to humble the king so that he, if, so that he could uh, experience the blessings of his relationship with Yahweh. So the preposition al is a marker of advantage, meaning that this command was for the benefit of Nebuchadnezzar because it humbled him and it conformed his attitude and conduct to God's will for his life. And this is indicated by the fact that God always has the best interests of his people in mind when he disciplines them according to what is said in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4 through 12. Also, the, the discipline served the king well since he repented and praised God for delivering him. But again, we could also translate this as a marker of disadvantage, meaning that this, was a, this sentence was against Nebuchadnezzar if we view it from the fact that God's holy and Nebuchadnezzar had, uh, had, had uh, crossed the line with God and didn't repent. Now, when it says, if you look at verse 33, let's look at the next statement. 
And we won't have to train, change too much of the translation here. It's pretty good. It says, immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. And it says, and he was driven away from mankind. That phrase, and he was driven away from mankind, it presents the result of the command to depose Nebuchadnezzar from power for seven years as a result of giving him the mental disorder of boanthropy. So you could translate this verse up to this point. Immediately the word concerning or the command uh, concerning or for the benefit of Nebuchadnezzar was executed so that the result of the command being executed was that he was driven away from mankind. Thus you can translate it, and he was driven as so that he was driven. So that those two words uh, uh, mark a result, or you could say consequently or even therefore. Both of those, all those words mark a, a, a result clause. And then it says, and he began eating grass like cattle as a result of the execution of the sentence. Now that phrase, and began eating like grass like cattle, is actually what we call an ascensive clause. A-S-C-E-N-S-I-V-E. -E. And what it means is that this phrase is expressing the shock. You translate an ascensive clause, you begin an ascensive clause with the word even or put it in the sentence somewhere to, to mark that it's uh, a sense of. So this word, uh, this phrase, and began eating grass like cattle, it expresses the shock that Nebuchadnezzar, a world ruler, ru word ruler, a world ruler, would be fed grass like cattle, and it denotes that this is out of the ordinary or not what we would expect a human being to do. So when I say in a sense of clause, you could translate it like this, and he even, be even, he even began eating grass like cattle. This clause is expressing shock. It's out of the ordinary. We wouldn't expect a worldwide ruler to act like this. So thus we have, it, we're, saying, uh, we're saying to you that it, it's, a shock, it's presenting something that's out of the ordinary, of course, and shocking to the reader. Now when it says he began eating, that's, the, uh, that's one word in the Aramaic. We have the pa'al, imperfect form of the word ak'al, which literally means to chew to pieces and refers to Nebuchadnezzar chewing or eating the grass of the field. It portrays the king chewing grass like cattle. Have you, uh, have you ever seen a cow eat grass? It's kind of like watching Tyler Thompson eat, a, eat cheeseburger. I don't know how he does it, but... My, I tell you, my sister, when she was... I, I couldn't... In, early in the morning, I wasn't a morning person, right? It's, trust me, it's about eating, chewing. Early in the morning, you know, when we were going to school, you know, I'd be trying to read my sports page. That was me. Read my sports page. And we're eating our Cheerios or whatever we were eating for cereal. And my sister, I don't know why she did this, but she used to go like this. She, she'd chew with her mouth open. It drove me crazy. It was like, Linda, will you shut your mouth when you're chewing your food? It was, just, I mean, it was obnoxious. It was, ah, I can't stand it. So, so anyways, and then, of course, her and my mother, you know, they'd be sitting, back then I wasn't a morning person. Her and my mother would be sitting there, dip, 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 and it's like, and I'd go upstairs just to get away from it. Just, gosh, just don't talk to me. I haven't woken up yet. Give me another cup of tea. So anyways, I got up there. I say, I say that because, I mean, of course, now I'm a morning person. I beat the birds before they come up. Now, the, uh, well, I say this because my sister, she chew, chewed with her mouth open. This word talks about <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar chewing like a like, uh, grass like a cow, like cattle. So uh, it's kind of interesting. Don't cows have like several so stomachs, don't they? Yeah, I think they do. Yeah, they have a, yeah, something like that. Were well, you been reading up on it? Or did your father tell you that? He probably told you. So they, this, this word means he, he began chewing to pieces the food he had, the, the, the grass. Now, it's interesting. The imperfect tense or conjugation is what we call a habitual per, imperfect, meaning that Nebuchadnezzar performs this action on a habitual basis for seven years. So this, the imperfect conjugation is describing this to the reader as happening on a habitual basis. This is what he did throughout the seven years. I mean, what a life, huh? But anyways, then and it says, then we have the phrase, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven. Uh, when it says was drenched, that's the uh, hit pa'al, imperfect form of the word, set ba, which means to be drenched with the dew from heaven. It's correctly translated. Now this word, along with the prepositional phrase which follows it, means to be expressed, means to be exposed to the elements as an animal. Now the, the, the hit pa'al stem, which is the Hebrew equivalent is pa'al, it uh, is iterative, and it denotes Nebuchadnezzar being continually drenched with the dew from heaven over a seven-year period. And the imperfect conjugation of this verb is an habitual imperfect, meaning that this took place on a habitual basis 
for seven years. This is what this guy did for seven years. And we're going to talk a little bit once we get through the, we only have a little bit more of the Aramaic, and then I'll give you my translation. And then some things about uh, Nebuchadnezzar being deposed from power and what went on during that time uh, while he was out of power. Now, then we have, lastly, if you look at the New American Standard, it says, immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled so that he was driven away from mankind. And then we could say he even began eating grass like cattle. Also, his body was drenched with the dew with, from heaven. And then it says, until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Now, that phrase, until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers, is composed of the preposition ad, which is followed by the particle d. And now together, they're translated correctly here, until. Then we have the construct form of the noun sa'a, which means hair. It's modified by the pronominal suffix hu, which is functioning as a, a possessive pronoun referring to Nebuchadnezzar, meaning his. And then we have a prepositional phrase. We have the preposition ki, which is used in a comparative sense. It means it's translated here like correctly. And then its object is the word nesha, which means eagles. And that's followed by the pa'al perfect form of the verb Reba, which is translated here, had grown. Now, the preposition odd is employed with the particle D, as I said before, and they mean until, they're correctly translated, because they function together as a marker of duration with reference to another point of time. You see this often in, the, in, uh, in, you see it in Greek, you see it in Aramaic, Biblical Aramaic, you see it in Biblical Hebrew. A lot of times, preposition and particles are joined together to form a word. They do, they do that a lot. Now, this, these two words are a temporal marker that indicates that something occurs up to the time indicated by its object. So here, it denotes Nebuchadnezzar being driven from mankind and eating grass like cattle and being drenched with the dew from heaven until his hair became long like eagles and eagle's feathers and his nails like a bird's claws. The word rabah means to be, it just doesn't mean to have grown. Uh, you look at this word, and you look at the lexicons and whatnot, in the context, it means it became extremely long. It says that his hair became extremely long, and its subject, of course, uh, is Nebuchadnezzar's hair. So this word rabba means to become extremely long. So therefore, this verb denotes that Nebuchadnezzar's hair had become extremely long as a result of being driven away from mankind and uh, as a result of God executing the sentence against him and punishing him with a mental disorder of boanthropy. So it, it means it grew long, not just grow. It, it, meant, it went very long. It never got cut during those seven years. So he probably looked like uh, you're a, a modern-day rock star. I, mean, I don't know if they cut the grow the hair that often. Uh, but, uh, so therefore, let me, let me, let's give the translation. Let me give you my translation of the verse, which I noted earlier when we read up to this verse in, uh, from my translation, the first 33 verses. In, in verse 33, my translation, at that very moment, you can translate it immediately. I like at that very moment. It's more explicit. The command was executed for the benefit of Nebuchadnezzar. Consequently, he was driven away from mankind. He even habitually ate grass like cattle. Furthermore, he was continually drenched with the dew from heaven until his hair became extremely long like eagle's feathers. Likewise, his nails like a bird's claws. So in verse 29, if you recall, that verse makes clear that the execution of this sentence, which was for the benefit of Nebuchadnezzar to humble him, didn't take place until one year after Daniel interpreted the vision for Nebuchadnezzar, which Daniel followed with, with advice for the king to repent. However, here in verse 33, this verse makes clear that the king remained arrogant and did not repent and then suffered the consequences for his stubbornness. Why wouldn't he repent? He's arrogant. He's arrogant. That's why he didn't repent. Why is the devil... Why is, the, why is the devil has never repented and why will he never repent? God says he's arrogant. Arrogance doesn't want to acknowledge the truth. All, arrogance in this context means that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't want to acknowledge that God is sovereign. So God's going to make him suffer and then that's going to be what it, he needs to acknowledge that God's uh, sovereign over him. Just like you do again with parents and the kids. Oh, the kid doesn't want to, doesn't want to, he doesn't want to, uh, you know, cut his toenails. <laughs> he doesn't want to take a. He doesn't want to uh, mow the lawn. Well, we'll make, we'll do something that's going to hurt him. When he's younger, you give him a spanking. Later on, you take away his cell phone, <laughs> or you know, do so, take away his computer. Something that will hurt him, and then he learns the lesson. If he doesn't, he's extremely stubborn and probably needs to have even some more severe discipline till it hurts. So some people 
they, they, you could give them, you could, God can make them suffer as much as he, just put them through the ringer and they still won't, they still won't uh, acknowledge God's sovereign over them. They still will not submit to God's authority over their life. So the punishment was for the king's benefit in that it was designed to humble the king before his creator and redeemer. It was also designed to conform the king's conduct to the will of God. You know, the, the Lord wanted the king to treat his subjects as, as he would himself. However, the king mistreated the poor in his kingdom as implied by Daniel's advice in Daniel 4.27. So the king, uh, well, we see, I, I mentioned before, I wanted to talk a little bit about what would have happened, what happened during that time, um, during the seven years. I think Titus asked the question about what was going on during that seven years. How, what would they do with Nebuchadnezzar? Or uh, Tyler might have said, where was he? Well, it doesn't say where he was. Uh, he was hidden from view, though, Undoubtedly, the king was hidden from the public view. Um, this is not new in history. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, and I know firsthand. I know somebody who worked for uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, direct, uh, worked under Reagan, knew the guy, met the guy. You know, he was, uh, and he knew the people around Reagan when he was in office. And the last couple of years of his presidency, he was suffering already from uh, de uh, dementia, from the, uh, the uh, Alzheimer's. And uh, they kept it from the public's view. This was, this was they, they, they even talk about it today, how in the world we were, they were able to keep it from the public during those last couple of years. But he was suffering from it already, from, from these people who were around him. And, uh, so, and, and there's also an even classic case back with uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson in the early 1900s. Woodrow Wilson had a stroke and nobody knew it. The American people didn't know it until years after. And his wife basically was, do, in effect, running the whole show. Uh, she, Woodrow Wilson's wife. He couldn't do anything. He was incapacitated. He had a stroke. But the American people didn't know about it. And so th this is nothing new where uh, world leaders are suffering something and it's hidden from the public. The public are not, they're not uh, privy to what's going on with them, probably for national security reasons, obviously, in a lot, in a lot of cases. But uh, we see uh, in, in our country, there's no reason for a president to be, you just have the vice president take over. But um, for whatever reasons, they didn't, uh, he didn't step down, Reagan didn't step down and, and neither did Wilson. And uh, so we see here is that Nebuchadnezzar, he undoubtedly was hidden from the view of the public. Now, where he might, it doesn't say, the text doesn't say, it's really not important. The point in this issue is that Nebuchadnezzar was deposed from power to humble him. And it worked. Now, we see that he might have been hidden in a secluded park, which is more likely the case, so that the public would not know his true condition. So they probably put him out in a park. We know a park because he's eating grass. So they say, okay, the king's out in the park. They probably built fences or something, kind of petition it, so nobody would know. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, that Nebuchadnezzar was not murdered. Now, this is quite astounding. This tells you, you know, Nebuchadnezzar talks about the great miracles that God had done for him. It was a miracle, first of all, a supernatural occurrence, not only that he got deposed from power for seven years, but the guy was never assassinated. I mean, in the ancient world, despots, and even today, you know, you you got people who got power hungry, rivals, uh, everybody's trying, you know, they, you know, even kings kill off their own children or, you know, brothers kill off brothers who are in, you know, uh, so that in order that they won't be a threat to their, them holding the throne. So it's amazing. It's a miracle. This is one of the miracles that took place that Nebuchadnezzar was never assassinated when, you know, that, or didn't get out that he was uh, in this condition and nobody did something about it. So that Nebuchadnezzar was not murdered by his enemies while suffering from this mental disorder of boanthropy for seven years is the direct result of the sovereignty of God. God didn't want him out of power. He just, he wanted him out of power for seven years, but he wanted to put him back in power. Remember, that it's, it says that, Daniel's interpretation. He would be restored to power, reinstated after he acknowledges that God is sovereign over him, and he wouldn't, God wouldn't let him do that, acknowledge his sovereignty over him until the seven years were up. God wanted him to suffer during those seven years to learn a lesson. So uh, we see that God's sovereign. So this tells us, again, that God is the one who puts rulers in place. Daniel told us this, Daniel 2, 19 and 20. He deposes leaders and he raises them up. Uh, uh, he is the one who determines when they leave, when they rise to power, and when they are de uh, are deposed. So let's say, for instance, uh, uh, Adolf Hitler. What was that movie, Valkyrie? I love that. That was a great movie. Uh, uh, Tom Cruise was in it, and they were trying to assassinate Hitler. Okay, God didn't want it to happen. Now people say, "Oh man, 
how can you say that? Well, if God wanted it to happen, he would have been dead. <laughs> if he wanted it to be successful, the assassination attempt on, uh, on Hitler, he would have let it to happen and would have killed him. But God worked out the circumstances and everything so that Hitler wasn't killed. He was injured, but he wasn't killed because God didn't want him dead. Why wouldn't God want Hitler dead? Because God was using Hitler to punish Germany and other nations. That's why. He was using Hitler for his own intents and purposes. It's just like with Nebuchadnezzar. We saw that in Jeremiah 27. Nebuchadnezzar, before he became a believer in the Lord, he was a despot, a tyrant. And God handed Israel, uh, 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 Tyre, Sidon, all the nations of the Middle East, Egypt, into his hands. And he was a, he was a brutal dictator like a Hitler, Nebuchadnezzar. And yet, God, what did he say? God said that was his servant, Nebuchadnezzar. God wanted to use him to discipline and judge wicked nations like Israel. So that's why God didn't want Hitler killed. He wanted him alive because God had his own purposes for doing things. See, man's ways are below God's ways. As Isaiah said, God's ways are above our ways. We like to think we know better than God. We don't. We got to learn how God thinks about things and then we're wise. So Daniel when, during these seven years when Nebuchadnezzar was deposed from power, Daniel would have played an instrumental role during this period by protecting the king and his interests as well as encouraging the royal dignitaries. Now, Daniel would have informed them of God's plan for the king's restoration. In fact, he said that before the whole, when he gave the interpretation before the whole royal court. Now, that Daniel... Now, why do I say Daniel would be instrumental in protecting the king during the seven years he was deposed? Is it reasonable or is it unreasonable? I say it's very reasonable and more than likely, and likely it did occur because Daniel was the one who was protecting the king. Now, Daniel, why would he get this kind of respect? Why wouldn't they get rid of Daniel, get him out of the way? There's too much respect for Daniel. You got to remember, Daniel, first of all, was the commander over the wise men of the city of Babylon. He would also have been greatly respected in the royal court, especially when this prediction came true. Remember, Daniel gave this prediction in front of the whole royal court. So that would have given him a lot of respect. So he would, uh, he would have had, uh, because of his prediction becoming true, that the king would be deposed from power for seven years while eating grass like cattle, that, would, that prediction coming true would have given Daniel credibility. People would have listened to him. He would have been respected. Those in the royal court would have revered Daniel as a result of the fulfillment of his prophecies and ability to interpret dreams, but also because of his integrity of character. So you got to remember something. Daniel's representing the God of Israel. They'll, the people in the Babylonian court that are heathen, they're afraid of Daniel. They see what his word... Then some of them might not have believed that Daniel's God. They might have thought that Daniel has power in himself, which he didn't. God was using him. But nonetheless, they would have respected Daniel because... When Dan, Dan, I mean, he just he just said this was going to happen to the king. It just happened. He's the most powerful man in the world. This is crazy. This is this is supernatural. He's acting like a cow for seven years. They would have been totally in respect of Daniel. Plus, he's the commander of the wise men. He would have got the respect of the the military. So Daniel would be the guy who protected the king during those seven years. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar is a believer. So Daniel is protecting a fellow believer here during those seven years. That's why Nebuchadnezzar was never assassinated and never killed, because of Daniel's power and influence there in the Babylonian court. Daniel was the guy who kept protecting. And the other thing, the main thing is, is God was using Daniel, but God's sovereign. God would, had prevent, would prevent anybody making an attempt on the king's life so that the discipline could be carried out and then the king would be humbled and then he'd restore him to power, which would make Daniel probably the most respected man in Babylon at that time. Well, you've been a great audience. We'll pick this up tomorrow in verse 34. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us with what we've heard, help us understand and apply what we've learned. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.